Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to go right into it, and we're going to be talking about Guatemala. And before I go into to the specific cases, I wanted to remind you that although I have two of the commissioners here, it's such a great honor to be with you from the CEH. It's important to know that when we are investigating uh, what happened in Guatemala, we have to think of three different scenarios as far as human identification. Uh, first is the massacres, then is the people who died while they were in hiding, and you heard a little bit about that today in the testimony, and that creates another scenario and another uh, phenomena that we have to investigate, and then we have to remember that the enforced disappearances are not crimes that are committed massively. I mean, there were many of them, but they were all individual crimes, which means they have to be investigated individually. And this creates three different scenarios um, in which we have to remember that we have different types of testimony. And you saw, again, you saw that today, uh, not different types of testimony, different types of evidence. And you saw that today in the previous presentations, but we're talking about testimonial evidence on one side, physical evidence on the other side, and documentary evidence. And it's when we, we can use the three types of evidence together to corroborate each other that we begin to understand what happened. And let's try to go through this. One of the things that we, I wanted to explain to you about the work we do is that it's, it's based on trust. And although it's considered to be scientific and it's considered to be, uh, well, to show evidence of what happened. Unless we have the family's trust, we can't do what we do. And there's many ways of building that trust, but one of the things that we always uh, try to do is explain to, to everyone what they're gonna be going through. In other words, explain to them what they're gonna be seeing, explain to them how we're gonna be working. And sometimes that can be very uh, upfront and blunt, but it's important that when people go to a site that they know what they're gonna encounter. And that's the reason why we invite and make sure that the, that the, the survivors are participants in every stage of the, of the process. They're participants with us in the field. Um, and we might, in different scenarios, other than Guatemala, we used to get criticized for this, saying you know, this is not a scene of crime work if the families are there, and they're contaminating the scenes. But we argue against that. And now, as a matter of fact, we are supporting work in Mexico and El Salvador and Honduras and Sri Lanka and Colombia because we've made people understand that unless you can establish trust and make the families a centerpiece, make them the focus of the work. And I think someone said it, I'm not sure it was Otilia who said it earlier. She said, this work is not really about the dead at least that's what I understood. It's about the living, and it's something that we take with us. We go to the graves because we want to reestablish the connection between the living and the dead. So the first thing that we have to do in that process is uh, listen to the family members, understand who, who we're looking for, explain to them, get the right permissions, make sure people are, are fully aware of what they're, they're doing. Taking DNA samples is also something that's very profound and important in this process because people, see it might be easy to understand once you see it from the outside, but from the inside, a lot of times people don't want to find their loved ones dead. They want to find them alive. And talking to uh, people of Sri Lanka, for example, I was given a presentation and one of the survivors stood up and said, if you continue showing us these pictures and talking about the dead, I'm leaving. And I said, I wish you wouldn't leave, but at some point it's important that you, you look for them also among the dead. We had a meeting in Guatemala where they asked that question to the survivors of Guatemala and said, is there a time when you stop looking among the living and begin looking among the dead? And one of the survivors in Guatemala said, the first day my son was missing, I went to, to the hospital, I went to the jails, and I went to the morgue. And I haven't stopped doing that for 35 years. So I'm never going to give up hope that I'm going to find him alive. But I also have to be realistic that most likely he's not. And so people are looking in every place possible. As you can see, in many of the investigations, the families are there with us. This is 
an investigation that's taking place most of the times in the communities where these crimes happened. And they become a part of the entire investigation. Of course, we control it and we have to make sure that there is no contamination, but we can't hide and we can't put barriers and we can't close places off because this is, these are people's histories. Eventually, once we're done in the field, we'll take the remains to the lab where we you know, try to reconstruct what happened and try to individualize the remains, understand if these are children, if they're adults, if they're men, if they're women, how people died, try to understand if these are entrance gunshot wounds, did they come from the top, did they come from the left, did they go to the right, did they come from the front or the back, or were they struck by machetes instead? So we individualize, but we also determine the cause of death or try to understand what happened to the individual to cause their death. But even in the lab, we get visits from the community. So even here, we have about 10 visits scheduled throughout the year with communities that we work for, but we get many, many more. And what we're trying to do is make sure that they stay informed and they stay connected. Eventually also, we have our own DNA laboratory, and an accredited DNA laboratory, and what we're trying to do there is compare the DNA profiles that we're getting from the remains to the DNA profiles that we're getting from the families. So we have human identification, but we also have determining the cause of death. DNA does not let you understand how a person died. It might let you understand if they fit within a specific family, but not how they died. But eventually what we want to do is be able to return that body to the loved one. So that's how we define what we do. We are experts in human identification. We actually used to, I mean, we are still called the Guatemalan Forensic Anthropology Foundation, but we don't really think in those terms anymore. It's a multidisciplinary approach uh, conformed of investigators, anthropologists, archeologists, and geneticists, all trying to put together and solve these crimes that are Again, over 35 years old. Um, and I've heard this scene explained by a friend the other day as the most amazing thing he ever saw. And I'd never thought of it in this way, but when our investigators put the remains in the box and an anatomical position, he described it as humanizing the body and as putting a life back together. Of course, um, he doesn't work with us, so he could see it from a different point of view, but now I see this scene as very, very different, but this takes place every time we identify someone and give the remains back to the families. Uh, and of course, if we could bury the bodies, it's the best case scenario, but sometimes we can't. So in this case, this is Comalapa. This is a former military base where we exhumed 220 bodies, but we've only identified 47 throughout time, including people that are in the military diary from the city. It's, it's a complicated scenario because it's in force disappearance. But the organization Conaviwa built a space there, a space for memory. So what we decided to do is, because we needed to re return the bodies to the families after we exhumed those bodies in 2003, and as it's stated in the Minnesota Protocol, which we'll be talking about tomorrow, uh, when you don't identify a body, there's a specific time that you're supposed to retain it to continue to do everything you can to try to identify it. But after a certain time, what we decided to do is that we're gonna rebury these bodies or we're gonna place these bodies back where we found them. So the ones that are identified, we gave them back to the families. But the ones that were not identified are gonna be waiting here for identification. The identification process continues. So this was designed, this is the generation, the creation of a, mem a memorial for victims of enforced disappearance uh, in Comalapa. It was uh, generated with the community, and that's sort of an image of it where the bodies are gonna be placed in individual crypts and in, in groups of six. A single, no trees are gonna be touched, there's gonna be medicinal plants served, and there's gonna be plaques also put in place with the names of the people that we're they're searching for. And obviously there's also, right next to it, there's a ceremonial area. Now this is not a created ceremonial Mayan altar. This is an existing one that was always there. It was there before the military took that hill and it's still there today and it's still in use today. So the idea is to generate three spaces, the memorial area, the ceremonial area, and the recreational area to keep the kids busy. 
Now, in this, when I was invited here to speak about memory, I was like, memory? We don't really frame our work as memory work. Um, I've been told that it can be, but then we don't like to put labels on what we do other than we try to we search and we try to find and identify people who have been disappeared and give them back to their loved ones. And that has different purposes for justice, for truth. Uh, but in this case, we, started, we teamed up with the Shaw Foundation because what we found, well, the USC Shaw Foundation, created by Steven Spielberg, uh, during the filming of uh, Schindler's List, people began to, to come to Spielberg to tell him the stories of survival of the Holocaust. And he decided to film them. Um, and he filmed 53,000 survivor life histories. And these are in an archive that is searchable and that um, it's, it's 1,500 of those are public and the others you have access to through access centers that are usually in universities. But when we spoke to them, we figured this would be a great way of telling the story of Guatemala, of, of asking family members, survivors that we've worked with with for the last 20 years if they want to talk in front of a camera. And so we have, we have started to also go to these communities, go back to these communities, which has helped us with the forensic work quite a bit. So far we have 439 interviews, 220 of men and 219 of women. That was by chance. Eventually I'm sure we're gonna have more women talking to us. Uh, these are the regions where most of the, investi uh, of the interviews have taken place. As you can see, they align with where most of the crimes are committed. These are the ethnicities, and of course, the majority of the interviews right now are in Spanish because we only have one of our investigators who's Quiche. The plans for the future are to, to also incorporate more Quiche speaking, uh, more Mayan speakers of different languages so we can also begin to interview because the interviews are without translation. They are with specifically in the language of the person who's giving uh, the interview, usually in their homes or in a place where they're comfortable. The themes around it, it most, I mean, they're, they're diverse and we're having trouble putting them in groups again in labels because um, Unfortunately, as you heard earlier today, the person who survived the massacre was also raped and tortured, and so it's difficult to put them in these labels. So there's direct witnesses sometimes, uh, sexual violence, people that were detained and tortured, the people that have a family member who's disappeared, survivors of massacres, survivors of, ex of direct executions, enslaved children, displaced or exiled. And, uh, they go through different stages. These interviews are not guided in the sense of, we don't have a, a, a script. They are open-ended questions and they begin with, what is your first memory? And all the way to today. So sometimes they last eight hours. Um, and they're unedited and eventually they are indexed with 65,000 keywords and that's what makes them searchable. I so I'll give you an example. Jugamos de, a veces de, de, de chibol, lo que le dicen bolisink, y a veces jugamos de trompo también. Entonces salimos a ir a bañarse en el río, a jugar con los otros patojos, así. Y antes tratábamos de construir nuestros juguetes, porque no lo había. Eh, hay, hay unas eh, ruedas que tratábamos de hacer con palos y nos poníamos a jugar. Juntábamos fuego, jugábamos trastecitos. Jugaba así con mis amigos porque ya habían varios patojos ya. Y yo jugaba con mis hermanitos también. Hacíamos una cosa muy viejita. Va a cargar a mi mech o, o a jugar tierra. O dice que va a poner con mal en el suelo, dice que a tortear. And then, of course, as the interview continues, uh, they might go from explaining how they played with toys or what they ate or how was the town into, into issues of, of the conflict. Yeah, pie, hay un camino que sale de ahí a Pachay cuando topamos con, con los soldados que estaban ahí escondidos. Y, y como sabían todo lo que hacían, que, que a todos los mataban, 
no, no nos paramos, sino que nos volvimos para atrás. Más adelante, donde nos huimos, había, había un, un sembrado de milpa. Llegamos allí, les dije yo a, 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 los, a los niños pues, que se acostaran en esa cuneta. Y, y había el, el zacate, estaba grande, estaba por aquí el zacate. Entonces yo empecé a doblar el zacate sobre de ellos y después me metí yo debajo. Terminando de, de hacer eso, llega un helicóptero a dar vueltas sobre nosotros y a dar vueltas. Pero como estábamos escondidos bajo el zacate, no nos vio. Y de ahí bajó el helicóptero, ahí cerca donde, donde mataron a mi esposa. ¿Qué fue a traer ahí o a dejar saber? Pues, pero llegó el helicóptero. Cuando llegamos al carretero, empezaron a disparar. ¿Qué tiro? Empezaron a sacar. Entonces, con eso me dio miedo. Yo, yo ya no sentí. Yo corrí. Ya cargaba a mi chiquita. Corrí, crucé la carretera. Cuando me fue embarocado, iba al disparo. Aquí pasó, ve. Me caí yo, pasó el disparo. ¡Pah! ¡Pah! El disparo. Por estrellas, las luces, aquí pasó. Y yo me caí sobre una, una corona de espina. Es una cicatriz la que tengo aquí. Al rato, como, como 20 minutos, cuando es, escuché los gritaderos de los, los niños, empezaron a gritar, Ey, como lo hacen a un marrano, lo maten. Se terminó sus voz. Dios mío, dije yo, yo ya solo orado, pidiendo, pero ya no se puede hacer nada cuando llegó la hora, ya no se puede hacer. Solo cruzamos el carretero, encontramos una cabecita, estaba tirada abajo la alambre. Y fueron más ellos, ay Dios mío, aquí están los niños, ¿qué te pasó? Dijeron, ay tus hijos, dijeron, ya estoy, ya. se perdieron mis hijos. Ay, yo los voy a encontrar muertos, tuve y los moví. Como no se llama José Dolor, ay Chepa, ¿qué te pasó? ¿Qué te pasó? Le dije yo, así le de ya lo tienen aquí, ¿ves? aquí les dieron la arma, que arma cuchillo, no sé qué usar. Hoy aquí les dieron. Se está por. A couple, couple minutos. Mi violar. Es... ¿Sí? Mi violar sacó a mis hijos atrás, mi violar, y así. Eso sí, Dios, ya no. Mi, mi suegra se, se fue de esconder con otro cuarto porque podía asustar. Ya no vas a gritar. Si gritas, tener mucho cuidado. Si vas a gritar, déjame. Te vas a quedar una vez aquí, una vez muerto. Me dejan conmigo. Una noche estuvieron ahí y mi mamá. Pues ahí lo más triste para mí porque ahí es donde se abusaron de él. Eh, no. No, no. no lo puedo soportar. Eh, Imagínense, son 30 años, más de 30 años. Pero no, no se me olvida pues, lo que le hicieron a ella. I'll stop, but the interesting, and I think the most important thing for us is that although there's been several commissions and we've worked for the last 25 years, I've never heard people come out of there saying, this is the first time anyone cares about me as an individual. This is the first time someone asks me about my past and my present. They don't only want to know about what happened that terrible day or that terrible year or that terrible decade. They want to know about, you know, how it was and how it is today and how we got here. And it's, it's really helping us with gaining trust and it's helping us also to understand. Most of the women that we interviewed that suffered sexual violence, rape, were from a community in San Andres Acabaja, which is also, uh, it was, uh, we worked inside of a Catholic church that was used by, by, by the military as a, as a military base. And when we worked there, not a single one of those women 
told us that they had suffered sexual violence. It took 20 years later, uh, Conavigua working with them for 10 years, and this was seen as a graduation for them of now from not telling anyone to not going in front of a camera and telling the entire world about it. And uh, well, we have a lot to go. So everything I've heard here today is amazing. It really is. And it's an incredible group of people. But this is really only the beginning. We don't really know what happened in Guatemala yet. We know the generalities of it, but the specifics of it, there's so much more. So much more than we can even imagine, unfortunately. Thank you.